Welcome everybody to Uncluttered and Unfiltered with Eden and Christine. And we have a special guest today and we'll be introducing her shortly. Joni Nidey is a psychotherapist and hypnotist. So and, and we're not talking about the old Gilligan's right. Island where they're swinging <laughs> the watch and then you're clucking like a chicken or the things you see at the comedy club. We're going to talk a lot about things that you could utilize immediately, whether it's to release anxiety or to relieve fear. Ooh. I'm excited. There's a lot to unpack. I do believe. I do believe. Yes. Yes. So, so that is coming up. Of course, we'll unpack a little bit about the latest episode of The Golden Bachelor or what Christine has now said (laughs) is her psychological experiment. She's, yes, she's looking at it in a completely different way. Yes. What did you do this weekend? Well, it was my husband's member guest weekend, which means I was a golf widow from Thursday to Saturday night. So actually it was very nice for relaxing weekend. Um, I caught up on a lot of work because I told you we're going away for our 35th wedding anniversary and his 60th birthday for 10 days. Mm -hmm. So I'm catching up on a lot of things I need to get done before I leave. Are you all packed for that? I have every outfit packed. Today I just bought eye drops at the drugstore because that was the last thing on my list. And yes, I have a huge long list of everything I need to pack. And so, yeah, I'm ready. I mean, the trip starts in November 2nd. Okay. And she, okay. I want everybody to know (laughs) that today is the 23rd. So you are packed. Yes. I, on the other hand, was uh, on a trip this weekend down to Miami. I packed after I got off work and before I left. So I had 15 or 20 minutes to throw things in a suitcase. Now, granted, it was just a a weekend trip with nothing really on the schedule other than getting my son moved down there. So it wasn't anything where I had to think about where are we going out for dinner? Where are we going? But on the other hand, I even for a weekend can't picture you ever not being packed within 24 hours. Well, so, you know, this one's causing me severe anxiety because I am, I am not, first of all, I'm not a great traveler, even though I was a flight attendant, I'm not a great traveler. So especially nowadays, everybody's like, they lost my luggage. They canceled three flights. I had to sleep on the airport floor. So my anxieties start to really go through the roof. So I think the way to ease that is I have everything organized and ready to pack and everything's toiletry bags already packed. It kind of calms my anxieties. It's what works for you. Yes. And that's part of what we always talk about is finding what works for you. And that sounds to me like a great time to bring in Joni now because she may even have some things that you can be doing prior to your trip to relieve anxiety. So, so with no further ado, she is a psychotherapist and a hypnotist, Joni Nighty, who, Joni, uh, I hate to ask you to sing your own praises, but let's talk, for, first of all, a little bit about your bio. I want to talk about a book that you were just featured as a part of called Empowered Women in Business. But I also want to talk about what you do with young athletes and at the level in which these athletes perform. We're talking about Olympians, right? True. That's very true. So how does how does hypnotism feed into excelling at sports at the level that these guys are swimming in and doing these other sports? Great question. So hypnotism falls into that category by teaching athletes because they're already very good, but they have a tendency to do really well at practice to develop an understanding of how good they can be or they already are. But when they get to the competition setting, all of the nerves and all of the distractions come in. And so in order to hyper-focus on that, which is what hypnotism really is, it isn't sleep. It isn't, you know, not being aware of what the hypnotist is saying or even in self-hypnosis what you're saying to yourself. But it's that state of heightened awareness, hearing and understanding and allowing the mind to relax enough so that it can accept those suggestions and kind of set you up to rule out those distractions and shift and reset back into what the mind can be our own worst enemy. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's very powerful. And we are the ones we have to remember we're in the driver's seat when it comes to our minds. And so... If we rely on old habits that aren't changing anything and not helping us move in the direction of what we want, then we're not going to get what we want. 
Um, and sometimes we don't even know that we're doing pretty well. So we think, okay, you know, I'm, I'm surviving, I'm getting by. And sometimes it may be inconsistent. I get what I want, but if we have a real plan for it and we program and rewire our minds to, to get as far as we can get, to be curious about how much we can do, then it's, it feels like magic. It's not magic. (laughs) It's just your brain. And so I think also, you know, I have a lot of friends that are stage hypnotists. I really appreciate the value of entertainment, you know, just showing what the brain can do and in in the form of entertainment. But we need to also understand that clinically um, we can treat some very serious problems outside of sports. Let's say you've got Christine here who is incredibly organized. She's going to pack weeks before a trip, she's going to put things back where they go. And then you have someone like me, my mind is always racing. I'm on to the next thing before I've truly completed the task at hand. And therefore, maybe I'm going to just put something down right where I've left, right where I'm at so that I can go on to the next thing. Can can I be hypnotized or employ, employ some of your techniques to become a more organized person? If that's what you want, as long as that's what you really want. And you have a a really good idea, vision of what you want. It could be a mixture of the two. I feel like, you know, talking to both of you and watching the podcast, I feel like I'm a little bit in between because my, I have a desire to be, and I was at one time, a super organizer. And then life came along with kids and now grandkids and all the things that I'm doing. And I realized I need to tweak my vision to be who I can be. And, and who I want to be. And so, yes, the, the, the answer, the short answer is absolutely. Um, that requires a conversation and really going to a little bit deeper level to find out why you want to be that instead, what you think it will do for you. It could be that sometimes when I'm in sort of my craziest moments, I call them my crazy time, I can get a lot accomplished. And it's the energy, you know, sometimes that anxiety that you feel is the energy that you actually need to accomplish what it is that you want to do. I think, um, Christine, in your case, you know, wanting to be super organized and just feeling like when that's taken care of, you know, now that that's taken care of, I can enjoy this or I can move forward or I can see this as being a trip that I'll enjoy. Yes. And that's absolutely true. Yes. And so that you've set that up for yourself Mm -hmm. and there is something about, organize your the universe around you that makes us feel calmer right but it's not the only way because sometimes that's not possible and that's because of time it's because of uncontrollables things get thrown into our schedules that we just couldn't anticipate and so instead of having that uh uh-oh moment and that that feeling of panic i call it sort of a panic press if you will kind of presses into the body and the mind you can relieve those symptoms and move on And I, what's going on in both situations is there's number one, future pacing. So you're looking to the future, you know, about the way you want things to be Mm -hmm. right. But in the present moment, that's where the focus needs to be. What can I accomplish now reasonably while staying calm enough and enjoying the process? Mm -hmm. Because many times if we think it has to be a certain way, then we've already decided it's not going to be as enjoyable that we have to have all of this stress before it even begins. And so in times like that, it is good to kind of maybe time travel to how you want to feel when you get there. Well, that's what I've been doing Mm -hmm. because it's Mm -hmm. going to be very relaxing. So I've already had my Mm -hmm. vision of, you know, an umbrella drink and, you know. Whereas when I'm throwing my stuff in the suitcase, I'm thinking, yeah, if I forget anything, I will buy it when I get there, which becomes stressful because then you're looking for You can never item, find what you find. need which, yes. when, what you get there unless you're in a major big city. But let's yeah. let's let's go to what you said about um, let's say it is a scenario where you don't have everything you need to be ultra organized and therefore in a situation like for you, that could cause you some unease and some stress. For me, maybe it's something where I am getting ready to go up in front of a couple thousand people and and give a talk, something that I think everybody at least gets the butterflies for. What are some just quick exercises that are indeed hypnotism that we don't realize are using hypnotism 
that can calm our minds or put us in a, in a place where we can better perform these tasks. So the first thing is to just call yourself again to the present. So how do we do that, right? There's a really simple exercise that you can do, and it's easy to remember. It's called a three, two, one reset. So that will bring you to the present, first of all. And it's just three breaths in of any kind, doesn't matter how. Take three breaths in. And then the two is just crossing your arms and it's putting one, you know, one hand on the opposite shoulder and then the other. It's almost if you're giving up yourself a hug because that's bringing up some oxytocin already and some good feel com- chemicals. And then the one is just to breathe for one minute consistently, allowing that breathing to slow down and to imagine maybe that it has a color that relaxes you. And just go through that, allowing your body to drop some in the process. And just paying attention to your breath and nothing else. Just think about the temperature of the breath. This maybe the rhythm of the breath. Maybe where it is actually going physically. And all of that will bring you completely to the present. Because the brain, it seems so simple, right? But the brain has the chemicals now introduced. The brain has you focusing on your breath, which always brings you to the present and always brings that energy down and allows you to think. And then the next step would be, let's think about this. All of the things that, and you're both saying, they're, they're kind of a little bit like lies that you're telling yourself. But so you ask yourself, what is it about this that I really need? Do I actually know it's going to be stressful and then I'm not going to be able to find those things? And do I really need them to be okay? You know, I traveled to Paris and when I was so excited to run the half marathon there. And of course, my luggage did not make it. Right. And luckily I had, you know, a backpack that has had enough. You know, I knew I, I thought about it before I left. What if I get there and I don't have my luggage? So what? What does that mean? It means that whatever's in my backpack is what I'll have. And so I had to really take a look at what was important to me. And that was my running shoes. Uh-huh. You know, and I could rinse those out and wear those a couple of days. It's not really my style. I like clothing and all that's, you know, sort of especially in Paris. But I knew that, you know, that was the, the sort of the best case scenario that I would, you know, put in my, that backpack. And so we have to pack that mental backpack as well and find out what do we really need? Are we, are we telling ourselves stories that aren't true? You know, am, do I really need to be that anxious? Is this thing really that bad if I don't have something or if all my ducks aren't in a row, so to speak? You know, can I do things in, out of order and be okay? And the answer is usually always yes. It's just that we don't have a lot of experience with it when we work so hard to avoid it. So is what you're saying, Joni, that instead of putting so much thought into trying to avoid the situation, actually stop and think about, all right, so what if it did happen? What's the worst that could could go wrong? Or don't even go that far to the worst. I, I, I never like calling up the worst, you know. And well, and the worst never yeah. usually happens That's anyway. True. That's that why true. I don't even go there because I could, yeah, I could spend hours doing that, and then I'm yeah. like, God, not even half a thing ended up happening. And I always tell my kids that, yes, you know, That's just the- don't don't go down that rabbit hole because half of the stuff never even happens, at least not to the extreme you think of it in your mind. It's such a great point that you just. Made because the mind and the body are going through the whole process of stress. And if you think about that times, how many times you might do it, if that's your style or, you know, it's your habit, then think about how many times you've called up cortisol and all those hormones that aren't helping you and how you've maybe contributed to things that the body would like to sometimes, you know, not on purpose, but there are cells in there that, you know, with disease and, and things that could hurt us in the long run. And so, you know, for me, I'm always looking for how can I call up the good chemicals as often as possible? How can I stubbornly refuse to cooperate with things that create cortisol and why would I put my mind and body through something that's I'm future pacing that most likely won't happen Happen. and also trust that if something like that did happen I can handle it right or I have a network of people who can help me and we forget that we have this community 
within ourselves and other people. One of the techniques that I employ regularly that you taught me years ago on the local TV show that I hosted, this is how I got to know more about Joni and what she's able to do for her clients and her patients, is the... I think we used a water bottle where you're passing it back and forth in front of your face. Can you, and of course, we know some people are just listening, so we will direct you to our social media or our even our YouTube channel, but can you describe that process and then explain what that does for us? Yes, that's called bilateral stimulation. Bilateral stimulation is simply creating a situation that, that fills both hemispheres of the brain so that you can stop ruminating thoughts or unhealthy self-talk and also calm the bo- calms the body. And so we've incorporated, we're, we're, we're completely stopping all the thought processes. We're shutting down whatever else the body might be doing physically, you know, where that energy is moving around, being a little crazy in the body. And we're able to clear the mind. And then we want to put in affirmations or thoughts that are actually going to help us and not hurt us. And so the way it works is pretty simple. You just take an object. I always use a water bottle because it's big. And, and I think when we first learn things, we want it to be a little bit more dramatic, you know, so that it resonates with us. And you take it and you just start at the center. You can kind of hold it like at the midline of the body. If, you know, if you cut yourself in half, it would be right there. You just kind of right in front of the Maybe between the chest and the stomach. I'm going to do it with a pen while Christine uses her water bottle. Oh, that's perfect. And so you take it and you just pass it and you make sure you, you, when you pass it before you begin, you leave one hand at the midline of the body at all times. So you're passing the object and then coming back and then passing it to the other side and coming oh. back. Oh, wait. <laughs> I know I, I just did that see, too. I did yeah. it backwards, but yeah. I guess it probably doesn't matter as much. It does matter. Oh, it does. When, okay. When you are doing it, when you do it the opposite way, it means you're not focusing on doing just that. So are you supposed oh. to start a certain way, right or left? Yeah, so it doesn't matter. Oh, it doesn't which matter direction. which direction. No. But what okay. I was doing wrong was I was leaving the pen in the middle versus oh. taking it to either side. Okay, yeah. got and it. And the reason for that is... The, the idea is we want to clear the mind and we want to hyper focus on only what you're doing, that bilateral. And you want to watch yourself doing it. Look at your object. You know, it really makes it impossible to think about anything else. It does, because if you do start thinking about something else, one of two things will happen. You will do what happened earlier. You well, pass the wrong the right you know, the, it, it, the wrong hand. Wrong wrong, right. Or you'll slow down to think. And so a lot of times I'll demonstrate this on stage and I'll know that that someone had a thought. And I said, okay, we haven't quite interrupted the pattern yet. And they'll say, how did you know? They, you know, they think I'm like a magician or I just know th- things. I'm a fortune teller or something. But I said, no, I, I can't read your mind, but I can tell you why. And, this, and that's why. So it takes practice. It's so seemingly simple yeah but to the brain that's a very sophisticated process it's on my youtube channel i think i've got it demonstrated a couple of times and even in like you know bigger like stages and things like that but it is probably my favorite because it's so simple because we can usually grab an object some of my athletes and even myself i've gotten to the point where i don't actually need an object i can imagine an object uh, before public speaking, sometimes I don't have that advantage. I might have a seat or so I'll just kind of, it looks like I, I just don't care because I'm just kind of flitting around, you know, with my hands or something. Um, but we can get really, really good at it. And so, you know, that's important because it stops the thoughts that we don't want. But then we want to throw in what we want right after that. And just to add one more point, with anxiety, that's often you know, a big part of the bully, I call it in the brain, is we're focusing on what we don't want to happen. You know, think Mm -hmm. about that. When we were talking earlier, you were focusing on what you don't want to happen. Shifting and resetting from that to what you want is magical. We start to get those good feel hormones and, and, you know, all those chemicals again. And we're thinking about what we actually want. And when we do that, our behaviors and our thoughts and everything start to follow. And that's really the direction we need to go in. And so if you just think of that one simple thing, you know, whenever you're not feeling well, and especially with anxiety, it's going to show up one of three places, your head, your chest, or your stomach. 
Okay, because we've got a, a nerve, it's called the vagus nerve, and it runs, you know, from the top of your head, the, your brain, through your heart, to right and at the top of your groin, largest nerve in the body, and it's responsible for our nervous system. So you're, you know, let's say you're feeling a little uneasy in the stomach, you've got the, quote, butterflies, that sounds so lovely for something that doesn't feel so good to us, um, or you've got those palpitations in the chest, or just that, that pressure, or your head is hurting or it just feels a little weird, um, that's your sign to do something. You know, maybe that's when you do your bilateral stimulation. Because once we label that as nervousness, and this is bad, it, those two things together result in a hot mess, <laughs> okay? Uh -huh. And we don't want to elevate it. And so, um, by the way, excitement and nervousness physiologically are exactly the same thing. So could you say, and I, and I go through this with my daughter quite a bit because she will call herself out and say, I'm just feeling very anxious. Mm -hmm. Can we talk ourselves out of that by maybe using a different word when we speak about our own emotions? For example, if she were to say, I'm feeling some excitement or I'm feeling very energized right now about this. Is it, is, is that kind of where you're leading with that? You're, you're labeling your emotion and then it becomes a negative. Right. And, and that's what happens many times. And I think, I think just having an appreciation for the nervous system and not, not thinking it's a bad thing, understanding that when we get kind of um, that energy in the body that wakes us up, you know, cause we're like, uh oh, what am I going to do with this? Once we learn how to manage it and control it, first of all, it doesn't bother us. And when we stop telling ourselves it's a bad thing, you know, when it gets out of control, it is a bad thing. But we're the ones elevating that without, you know, I think most people just don't know they're doing it. And honestly, just realizing that we can quickly bring that energy down, kind of audit it, if you will, and mm -hmm. just say, hey, this is too much for me. I don't function well when it's this high. So I'm just going to take two minutes of bilateral stimulation or really 30 seconds, or I'm going to do an exercise like heart breathing. You know, you can just close your eyes and breathe and imagine that you're breathing through your heart. Because if you're nervous, most likely, and you're having all that energy, it's because you're about to do something or you're about to, you're interacting with someone that's important to you. And important doesn't have to equal scary or bad. So I think knowing and understanding and really teaching young people, and that's what I do, um, you know, all ages actually, but I think we're the, we are our age group. You know, you think about this podcast 50 and over, right? Focusing on that. I think we have to remember that they're watching us and, and it's a great opportunity to teach young people that you don't have to, you don't have to live with this the same way. Okay. I do have a few questions though. Please ask. So, I have a question regarding what's the difference between hypnosis and learning meditation? Okay, that's a great question. So meditation is more of a relaxed state that, and I, I find that many meditations aren't guided. Okay. So meditating um, sometimes leaves it to chance where your mind is going to go. But, I, you know, when the goal is peacefulness, usually you get to a pretty good place with that. But you're not bypassing necessarily that critical factor. And that's something I haven't talked about yet, but just really simply, we have our conscious mind, which we're using right now to talk to each other, ask questions and learn. And so we're, you know, in that alert stage and trying to not necessarily memorize, but get that information in there. And we're, we're kind of thinking about whether or not we think it's true or it would work for us, things like that. But there's the subconscious mind, which is all the, where all the habits live. So in hypnosis, we the goal is to create new habits and to break up those associations where the bad habits have been formed. Because bad habits are just like little clusters that we, because we've said things or done things over and over again, they bypass what I haven't talked about yet, and that's that middle part of the brain called the critical factor. And that part of the brain is wonderful, and it, it's really great that it's there, but sometimes it's not necessary and it's not helpful. And so it, once we learn about it, we learn to control that. And through hypnosis, we, we basically put it to sleep. So what it does is it was put there so that if we're in danger or we're in a situation, then we'll, that we'll react. And so we, our bodies do get that energy and sort of that, you know, 
call to alert, but we're not always in danger. And so it, it's tricky. So we have to say, hey, so what am I going to do about this? So hypnosis puts that critical factor to sleep so that we can make the suggestions. So you're listening first with your conscious mind. And we make those suggestions that it can bypass that, you know, the, that part of the brain that's going to question it, try to stop it because it might be dangerous, and allow those suggestions to go back into the conscious mind and become habits. And it's repetition, repetition, repetition. Okay, so speaking of, what is the difference if you're, you've experienced trauma? So I see on a lot of my shows I watch where they bring in a hypnotist when someone has been traumatized so that they'll think they'll remember what had happened, whether it's for use in law enforcement or if a woman has been traumatized in her life and she's 50 or older and she's still holding on somewhere to that trauma. Yeah. Is that where hypnotism would be really, really good? It's a really wonderful tool for trauma. So I work a lot with vets and post-traumatic stress disorder and also women and children who've been through abuse of different kinds. It's wonderful because we can actually go back and recreate movies if we want to. And that's what we always ask people. Do you want to, do you think you ever want to go access this again? You know, it would it help you in any way, maybe the first time, but the more we repeat trauma and we tell the story of trauma over and over again, the bigger that habit becomes, remember, repeat, repeat, repeat. Mm -hmm. So as a therapist, I'm a little bit different in terms of the way I do psychotherapy. But because I don't allow my clients to repeat the story, I need to hear it one time. Because if I allow that story to be repeated over and over again, I am contributing to those neurons back in, in the brain, in the subconscious mind, and I'm, making, I'm contributing to making that problem bigger, as they probably have for a long time. And so... You can do, there are so many different techniques that hypnotherapists can use. One of them is called, it's a timeline a, and a timeline reset. You can go back and have that person talk to that younger per version of themselves and, and say, hey, fast forward to this, this, the age that I am now. I'm now someone who is just learning to appreciate how much wisdom that I have, how many resources that I have. And I'm going to bring those and send those back to this child or this younger version of me and help to make it better. And so it, during hypnosis, there's some lightening of that trauma, if you will. I mean, the trauma still happen, but we're sort of cutting the cord between today and back then. And it works really beautifully. How many sessions, like for hypnosis, is it like psychotherapy where you go once a week or like, what does, how long does it take? And do you have to, what if it comes back? Do you just go back for a refresher? You know, yeah. you, you know, like, is it kind of like therapy where you really have to focus on it and really get yeah. it out of your brain and commit to this? Yeah, it's a, that's a great question. And it, it varies. Like we I do a lot of work with habits like smoking and, you know, all the kids that are vaping now, things like that. Um, other habits that, you know, people just don't like, you know, they're biting their fingernails. Cases like that are pretty simple. I do a one session with the smoking and I have backup audios that they listen to. And honestly, I rarely see them again, Wow! except to hear. That's great. Know. Yeah. Sometimes I never hear from them and you wonder, you know, cause you know, your track record is really good. You know how well the, the process work. It's kind of a long day though. They spend right. about three or four hours with me, right. but um, it's really is it's fascinating to think about, isn't it? How long you can have a habit and how quickly you can clear it. Is that by the way, something you could do virtually for somebody, the, 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 the long day part. I know you say you yeah. send them with some audio to listen to later. Yeah. I'm just asking because we know we have a global audience and somebody may want to reach out to you after the fact, trying to, whether it be quit smoking, eat a healthier diet or bite your fingernails, as you mentioned, yeah, whatever it might be, or, or even trauma work. We can do that. Yeah. I do tons of work on zoom and WhatsApp because I work with athletes internationally. Can yes. anybody be hypnotized? Well, within a, a certain IQ, you know, certainly if you have uh, problems where you can't understand certain concepts and certain speech and things like that, but for the most part, anyone who wants, wants to, to be, be hypnotized can, can be. be hypnotized. So not against your will? No, absolutely not. No. And that's the beauty of it. I mean, that's how our brains work. They're only going to accept suggestions 
that they want. You know, we're all all that way. And with hypnosis, you know, in the way that I practice it, we you know exactly what suggestions I'm going to make before I even start because we make it that very clear. We go through the whole vision of what you want, and even using uh, the client or the person's own words is very important. You know, they're the way that they see it. Do you really snap your fingers to wake somebody up? I'm just asking for everyone out there who watches <laughs> movies and TV shows. Is it really yeah. where you are kind of under a little bit of a trance or sleep or whatever you want to call it, and then you wake somebody up? So that that's a, a I like that question so much today, and I'll tell you why. I, I honestly can't snap my fingers. Oh. <laughs> and so as... <laughs> As a hypnotist, it's, you know, it's disappointing. It's so cool when my friends do it, right? Especially the stage hypnotist. But so, so I'm going to say no, personally, I do not. Um, the best way to come out of hypnosis or to bring someone out of hypnosis is a, a count. You count down oh. to go into hypnosis and you count up to come out. And, and we're raising our voice a little bit each time. I could clap. Eventually, you'll come out of hypnosis anyway. Okay. So as a hypnotist stops talking so, and so you don't have to worry. No one gets stuck in hypnosis. So for women over 50, since that's what this podcast is for, is it ever too late to break a habit through hypnosis? Never. That's okay. Great. So you hear that everybody out there, it's never too no, late. It's not. Habits are just that. And they work exactly the way I, I, I told you, you know, we, we do something over and over again, repetitively. It forms neurons in the brain like a cluster. That cluster continues to grow every time we do it and we don't change it. But by using hypnosis, we weaken those associations. We replace it with something else. You know, we're putting like holes in it and we're putting in what we want instead. What about mantras? And I know that's a word you use with meditation quite a lot, but what, it, what about mantras? Are there things we can repeat over and over and over to ourselves? I think mantras are essential. I think that I, I like to refer to them as self as affirmations and affirmations are simply statements that you're saying about yourself or to yourself as if they're already true. And that's an important part. And a lot of times, you know, I'll have, I love young people because they question you a lot and they'll say, well, isn't that like lying to myself? Because I'm not a great runner yet, or I'm not a great swimmer. Or I'm not a great this, you know, they're, they think they're pretty good. I said, well, the most important thing is where you want to go and shifting into what you want. We have focusing on that. And I said, if it bothers you that you feel that you're lying to yourself, think about it this way. When you're telling yourself all these other things that you can't do something, you're putting limits on yourself and you're also future pacing, not knowing what the result's going to be. You're also lying to yourself then too. Why wouldn't you make up something good? That's always my question. And it's a good question to act, ask yourself instead of, you know, well, this could happen or what if this, the what ifs, you know, what if this goes wrong? What if it doesn't? Where can people learn more and find out about maybe doing something virtually with you or take advantage of some of the resources that you already have out there? There's several ways to find me. I'll just mention a few. There's joni90hypnosis.com. My private practice for psychotherapists, we have 12 therapists, so we, we serve a, a, a large population. It's mycommunitybehavioralservices.com. So our, the name of our, our practice, and we're in two counties, is Community Behavioral Services. And also, um, I'm, I'm on Instagram, 90 Joni. You, you know, look for me there. My YouTube channel is probably the best because if you just... My name is spelled unusually, you know, N-E-I-D-I-G-H is a kind of a weird spelling. But if you look for Joni Nighty, I have, you can see me working with team. And of course, we'll put some links in our show notes as well. Yes. Yeah. Joni, we can't thank you enough for being here. Wow. That's, that's fascinating. It really is. The hypnotism, um, the whole aspect of it in our brains are, are really something yes. else. So uh, the world has been under the spell of Gary the <laughs> Golden Bachelor. And so we want to get a little bit of Golden Bachelor chatter. And this was episode four that we yes. watched. Yep. And just as I promised last week, I, um, I had it going on while I was doing some other things, but I there were a few things that happened that made me stop <laughs> what, what she I was, was doing, doing and say, what the, what the? Right. So the biggest, the biggest moment for me, the one that made me say, no way, 
I wonder if you felt the same way. It was Sandra who said that Ugh. she was missing her daughter's wedding to be on The Ugh. Golden Bachelor. I, you know what? I, I'm so, I was so shocked by that only because rumor mill has it that she doesn't even make it to the end. Right. Um, so I don't, I just don't understand. I see. In my feeling, because I told you I'm doing this from a psychological look at all oh, these yes, people, yes. there's something more to that story. Either yes. it's her daughter's it's, fifth wedding. I was thinking the same. I'm like, this daughter gets married it, every other day. Right. Or, you know, some story to this. Or because, a strange daughter. Yeah, she or, wasn't invited in right, the first place. Right. And then Gary says, well, let's just call her up. And they attempt to FaceTime and they're both like total boomers. They can't figure out how to make a FaceTime uh, right. call, yeah. which I'm sure. Uh, that definitely was the one thing that was very bizarre in this episode. Yeah. I, I just couldn't even imagine it, but, but you always take such great notes. What, uh, what you got on your list? Well, since we're on Sandra, she ends. Okay. Only on the golden bachelor would they play. Never would I ever with ice cream. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. And then Sandra, since we're on her, is lactose intolerant. I loved that. And then she's sick as a dog and misses the ceremony. And I'm thinking, this is so Golden Bachelor. Oh, I yeah. mean, so Golden Bachelor. Like, we're not going to do shots or have a drink or do it. It's ice cream every time. Yes. And, and then some of the things that some of the women, well, the one woman, the chicken lady who's out now, I call her the chicken lady, um, who's the therapist in Delray or Boca or whatever. She was the one that had done everything under the sun, left nothing to the imagination. Oh, that was a know, bit shocking too. Pulled around with someone else's husband. husband you know, it, it just things I could have lived my life without ever knowing, just mm -hmm. so you know. Um, so that to me, since we're on, it was very bizarre. Only in the Golden Bachelor are you going to play a game like that and do it with ice cream. And they're all not wanting to eat ice cream because they want to fit in these gowns for the rose ceremony. So I don't, I don't know who came up with that idea. But um, we saw that Trista, the original bachelorette, made an appearance. Mm -hmm. She looks amazing. She does. And I didn't quite get what she was there for. Uh, um I was a little confused by that, but because I'm thinking maybe, maybe because a lot of the women who watch the show that are watching the golden bachelor are our age. She was 20 years ago and that was the last season I ever saw. Right. So maybe that's why they brought her. Back. Well, I also thought it would have been better if they brought her back in and had her with them all the time, giving them like pep talks. It was like, she just went out to the pickleball court and sat there next to, you know, Jesse Palmer, whoever the host is. And the Joey, who I didn't even know who he was. Who Cause it? I, someone from, I guess the bachelor or bachelor, well, but I didn't I guess a big pickleball. Yeah. I think he's a coach now, a pickleball coach. So let's talk quickly pickleball. I don't play it, but everybody and their brother does. So I'm not bashing pickleball in any way, shape or form. But I mean, the one woman who got the hairline fracture, I just think that, I mean, four wheeling, I, I'm just so confused. These are my worst nightmares to come true. If I'm going on a date, it, I mean, not you, I know would love every minute of it. Cause you're like a thrill seeker and you like doing all that. Me on the other hand, I'd be like, I'm not getting on that four wheeler. Mm. I would play pickleball, but in the back of my mind, I'd probably be like, everyone's getting injured in this game. What if I don't get the rose because I end up in a cast and then the woman does. That's exactly yeah. what I was thinking would be my way of thinking about that. The, uh, the, the pickleball tournament brought out obviously some, some, uh, carnal qualities in some of the women, they were really playing to win. And, and that was fun to see because I think they also had the, the idea in the back of their head that Gary, everybody knows loves pickleball right. and they wanted to prove to him that they would be able to be somebody he could partner up with. If they were to spend the rest of their lives together, they wouldn't disappoint him on the pickleball court. So I think they but took Ellen it more seriously. Was the pickleball pro. Right. So I don't I didn't really think that was quite fair because she does it every day. She's like the coach of her team. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a little unfair just because she's already oh, sure. really, really, really good. And since we're on her, I uh, 
I definitely think she'll make it in the top, but I still am not feeling like he's going to actually pick her and she's going to be heart She has a broken. thick New York accent, right? Yes. Very, so this is going to sound unfair, but I just don't see this Hoosier, this nice Indiana guy, spending the rest of his life. I, I don't see that. the, the, the Which well, I don't she, think she's from New York. Oh, she's not. No, she, she's I, a Yankee of some sort. Yeah. Like, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm originally from Connecticut, so I'm yeah. not. And I have family from New York. I'm not. This has nothing to do with being yes. from New York. It's just the, the lifestyle. I think it's hard to change at 70. I can see them meeting much younger and being like, oh, you know, different cultures, different lifestyles, you know, things move more quickly up north than they do in the Midwest. Right. I just don't, I don't know. It just She's seem like so a match. in love though. She would move to Timbuktu for him. She did say she was falling oh in love with him. Oh my God. She is so in love. And that's when it gets me to Faith, who was kind of quiet the whole entire mm. episode. Didn't really say much or do much, but she did get a rose. So... I don't know. I mean, she started out strong, but I'm not, I'm not too sure mm -hmm. on her. And then, um, what was her name? The one Leslie, Leslie. I think she could do well. I like her, but she's the one who's I, had a couple of marriages and she's been single for 21 years. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I think he's going to be with a widow. I, yeah. And I just, I don't see him being with her. I'm sorry, everybody. If you, and I do like her. I think she's a smart woman. I think she's beautiful. I just don't see him with some, I think Leslie would, I mean, um, Ellen, the pickleball lady, that's what I'm naming her. I think she is a good fit, but I just don't see, I'm not seeing a lot of chemistry mm -hmm. except in Joan, which I've already made this prediction who had to leave because her daughter had the baby. I'm still not counting her out in the future, not future mm -hmm. episodes, just in the future. I, um, I think the previews are make, where he's sitting and he's sobbing and he's like, I, 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 this is the hardest thing I've ever done. In my, I think that's all drama for TV. Oh, yeah. I just, I don't know if I'm really buying that either. I'm not either. Now let's talk about Kathy and April. So Kathy and April, first of all, Nancy took herself out last week. I was calling Nancy Ellen and Ellen, Nancy, right. but Nancy took herself out of the game. She was just like, you know what? I'm not feeling it. You're not oh, feeling this it. episode. Nancy. This episode, yeah. Did. Yes. Right. She's so, the one with the stress fracture. Right. So she's like, mm, it's not happening anyway. So, and he's like, I can't deny that. You're right. But only in the golden bachelor, would you see that right. in the younger bachelor, they would never it, stress fracture or no stress. Oh, they, they would, would be, be there. It. They They'd be milking it. They'd be on crutches. They'd be hitting someone with a crutch. I mean, this shows when you're over 60, you're like, nah, no connection. Bye. Got to go. Got, yeah, you know, time, time is this. a run and run. Right? Time for no this time nonsense. for this. And then you have the whole, ugh, I was Kathy, so glad yeah. to see Kathy. So, so here's what's fun. April's the chicken lady. She and Kathy both didn't get roses. Kathy is the one who's trying to start all the drama yes. behind the back of the, the one other. She's purely awful. She's just awful. She's awful. I can't think of a better word than just she's vile. Uh, and she and, and and so what I liked was all the women, when the two of them were not given roses, they all said, We love you, April. And right. nobody said boo to Kathy. Yep. And then Gary said, Can I can I walk you out? And I thought to myself, he wants to make sure this woman's gone. Right. He wants to see her get in that limo and be taken away. And don't you know she turned around and said, you know, I'm gonna burn this house I down. Know. <laughs> I was so happy to see her go. But I have to tell you, with with her beef that she has. I, 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 there's something about the woman that she has the beef, beef with, which Teresa, Teresa just drives. I can't, there's something about Teresa. I just, I feel sorry for, her. I think part of it is, and I think she's playing a game. I think she's smarter than a lot of people are giving her credit for. I don't see him ending up with her. I really do not see him ending up with her. I think that she has a little bit of a whiny quality to mm -hmm. her. Um, and I don't know. I just think he's, 
a bit smarter than that, but I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. So this week I'm going to give a synopsis. Boring. Yeah, the whole thing's getting kind of boring. I really was shocked. I was very bored by this episode and it went quickly because I kept fast forwarding through all the commercials. And the pickleball. And the pickleball was boring to me. Not, Not just because I don't play pickleball. I just think it's... It just wasn't interesting enough. And I think they're not doing enough things for these ladies to do that's interesting. Yes. I mean, they. one thing I can say, the four-wheeler and then the hot tub out in the middle of nowhere, at least that was supposedly a romantic date. And I did think that that I'm, I'm the hopeless romantic. So to me... There was some romance in this season four. I just was not loving it the way I thought I'd keep loving it. So hopefully season episode five, I'm keeping my hopes up. Bring us back episode five. Yes. Okay. Having said that, we are going to make sure that you can find Joni Nighty in our show notes and then anywhere else you would like to seek her out. We would love for you to join us on social media. We are on all the platforms. We would love for you to leave us a review, subscribe, of course. We have a question we're about to post in our ladies only Facebook group. And I want to share that question with you because it's going to be the topic of an upcoming episode. So be thinking about this and you should be able to to join our Facebook ladies only group and answer this as an empty nester. What part of your life still feels unorganized, discombobulated? What, what, what aspect of your life or your home? And we'll try to tackle some of those things in an upcoming episode. Yes, because I get so many questions still on our Facebook ladies only group on organization. So we decided to do one episode, um, more broad topic. So what what is it in your life that is still just driving you crazy when it comes to organization, whether it's your home, family, friends? It could be your purse. It could be your purse. It could be your car. car. Yes, I was just going to say it could be anything. So 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 let us know. It could be packing a suitcase, whatever the case may be. Let us know there and remember with all things. And now we know that there are some processes and even some tricks that you can use on your own brain to help you with this. But you can always just let it go. And don't look back.